Well, good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started with the town hall meeting. Uh, Gary is going to go ahead and kick us off, and uh, then all three of us on the marketing team are going to present. We'll be accepting questions uh, through the methods that were presented on the first slide, so you can either email Chessie, text her, or submit your questions through the chat box, which should be found at the bottom of your screen. So, Gary, go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Katie, and welcome to you all for joining us tonight for our second annual spring bull sale season recap. We've got a number of data slides and uh, a number of subjects to go over tonight. As Katie said, please hold your questions or text them. Uh, we'll have an uh, we'll have a instruction uh, slide on that here in a few minutes. But if you will hold your questions until later, we would appreciate it very much. And if you haven't already uh, muted yourself, you can do so on the lower left hand of your screen. Uh, stop video and mute uh, so that uh, uh, we're not having a whole lot of feedback and extra noise. So with that, welcome again, and uh, let's go ahead and get started. We thought we'd kind of kick this off a little bit with uh, some of the things that, uh, some of the places that we went rather, and the miles that we drove and the nights we spent in a hotel room. The first sale I think we got to was in late January, and the last one was in early May that Harold made in Montana. So we had an extensive bull sale season this year, and you can see all the individual statistics there. But in short, and to summarize, we uh, flew a total of 26,780 miles and drove another 40,000 miles and uh, spent uh, over 140 nights in hotel rooms and away from home. So. Uh, we traveled by planes, trains, and automobiles literally everywhere we went. So it was a very busy season, and we had a lot of fun doing that. But we'll go ahead and get into some of the harder numbers here on our next slide. And if you'll look at, uh, well, I'm sorry, I need to back up a second. We wanted to talk a little bit about uh, having uh, a representative from the Red Angus Association of America at your sale. Most folks are really good about uh, sending us the dates and getting them on the website. Uh, we would like to know uh, the sale date at least 60 days in advance. We meet in January at board meeting in Denver and we start lining up who's going where and lining up our schedule. So if you can get those dates to us as early as possible, it's really, really appreciated. And another word on that is if you change your sale date, in other words, if you have been typically the third Saturday of March and have changed it to the second Friday of April or whatever, we would appreciate knowing that because we had a few instances this year where um, someone changed their sale date and did not notify us and we had it scheduled on the traditional date or the same date you had it last year. And so we missed some of those this year because of that. So please, please let us know and you'll increase your chances of having someone there from the association. And then it's not a bad idea to go ahead and call one of the marketing team members, either Harold, Katie, or I, and see uh, if you want someone to come and maybe some more details and so forth. We've been now, all of us have been to two or three sales, uh, typically been about the same sales every year, but sometimes they get changed up a little bit. So just a little bit about uh, what you expect from us when we go there. One thing that we would, uh, would like for you to allow us to do is to speak for a few minutes ahead of the sale to talk about marketing programs. That typically doesn't last more than three to five minutes. And so if we can just get in front of everybody there at the sale, uh, it would be much appreciated. We do get out into the pens, look at the bulls and speak with producers, but we can't talk to everybody. And this gives us a chance to kind of summarize the marketing programs that we've got going on and then people can find us later 
if they want to have more detailed conversations. I would also remind everyone that it's not the RAA's policy uh, to ring sales, so we do not take bids. Sometimes we're listed as field, sta uh, field uh, staff or ringmen, and that is uh, not the case, of course, and I think most of you are aware of that, but for some newer members, that might be news to them. And then if you do a pre-sale or a post-sale producer meeting, maybe it's not even right before the sale or the night before the sale, maybe it's another time of the year, and a staff member can be involved, and uh, if you would like to have us there, please let us know in advance again, and we'd love to participate in some of those opportunities because we can talk more in depth about uh, what we might be able to help your customers with. Now, we did travel to the majority of the spring 2018 sales, but we did not make every one of them. As most of you know, we had cancellations, we had postponements, we had change of dates, uh, we had some weather issues. Um, if we did not get to your sale in 20. 18 and you really want somebody there in 2019 call us and ask us and we'll try to work everything in um, it's it's hard to get to 100 percent of them but we will try our best to get there so with that let's move to the sale data and um, just a brief synopsis of the number of sales we attended this year it was 87 again that was from late january to early may and that's up seven from last year. The average sale price of the bulls this year was $4,784, which was up $251 from the previous year. <clears throat> and then the number of bulls sold at these sales, almost 6,000, uh, about unchanged from last year. And the average number of bulls per sale was 77. They ranged all the way from 15 to over 300. So we did have quite a range, but on average, they were about 77 hit. So with that, so let's take a look and see uh, some more price data. I have to give Katie a lot of credit. She put all of these slides, or most all of these slides together. But when we split um, bull sales out by quartiles, uh, according to price, we saw a larger disparity between the top 25% of bulls this year than we did last year. It was not quite so pronounced in 2017, but the top quartile of bulls, the top 25%, that top 1,500 bulls, basically, averaged nearly $8,700. Second quartile, 4581, 3438 for the third quartile, and of course, 2471 for the bottom 25% of bulls in sales this year. Again, a large difference from top to bottom. More pronounced this year than last year, and it was um, noted at all the sales that we attended that the front end bulls sold really, really well. There was a bigger drop off this year and there were several more bulls that did not sell uh, this year than there was last year. I do not have a specific number on that, but that was noted by everyone attending sales this year. Last year, we looked at the effect of uh, price and, herd, and how that corresponded or correlated with the herd builder and grid master indices. And again, this is somewhat uh, similar to um, the trend we saw last year, but we did not see, again, as pronounced difference from the top to the second, third, and fourth quartiles in the herd builder index. Last year, the top quartile was about 160, and this year it was 139. And uh, there was quite a drop down to maybe 120, but the top quartile of bulls this year did not have quite a high herd builder, average herd builder EPD as they did last year. When you look across the screen at the grid master index, it was fairly flat. Of course, we all know there's not a great deal of uh, play in those numbers. Generally 47 to 53 is gonna catch most of them. And even though that index was changed, at some point during the season, it was not enough to uh, have a big difference in the end. So we saw a trend downward from top to bottom on herd builder, but pretty much sideways on the grid master index. We looked at e a weaning weight and yearling weight EPD by those same price quartiles. And again, we saw a similar trend as we did last year, <clears throat> but again, maybe it was not quite as great, at least on yearling. And weaning was certainly fairly even across the bottom three quartiles, and the top quartile at 66 uh, excelled the others. And uh, you know, 
when we have so many commercial ranchers looking at weaning weight EPD, that's probably not a huge surprise. Calving ease direct. Everyone knows the calving ease bulls sell better. Uh, the calving ease direct score on the top two quartiles was eight for an average, and for third and fourth was six and five. We still have producers that place heavy emphasis on that and birth weight, actual birth weight, birth weight EPD and calving ease, so we saw that pretty easily. But producers really did not pay a whole lot of attention and give a whole lot of weighting to calving ease maternal, at least from our sales results, four, five, four, and four. We really didn't see a lot of difference there from the top to the bottom quartile. Birth weight EPD goes hand in hand with calving ease direct, of course. And similar to last year, we don't see as big a difference from the top to the bottom. The average EPD was minus 2.5 for birth weight in the top quartile and only minus 1.5 for the bottom quartile. Last year, it was minus 3.5 for the top with basically the same number of bulls being sold. And the bottom quartile was again about minus 1, minus 1.5. So a larger disparity in most of the carcass or most of the growth traits rather and the herd builder and grid master indices and as we move on to the carcass traits you'll see a noticeable trend again for the highest marbling epd bulls at 56.56 for the top quartile bulls down to 0.46 for the bottom quartile bulls and again we saw the same kind of trend for ribeye area with 0.22 on the top quartile, working their way down to 0.14 on the bottom quartile of bulls. But I would note that I think more and more producers are paying a little bit more attention. We're certainly seeing that in some of the phenotypes of bulls and having bigger tops, as Harold will probably talk about a little bit later on. We certainly need to probably improve on that area a little bit in terms of muscling in the red Angus carcass. So that would be for sure one thing that uh, producers are paying a little bit more attention to as well as marbling. So we will uh, again take questions at the end. That's the end of my uh, part of the presentation today. You can submit them to Chessie uh, on email at chessie at redangus.org or via text at the number shown on the slide set, uh, set or uh, the Ring Central chat box that you will find at the bottom of your screen. So again, if you would hold your questions until later, I will transition over to Katie Auctioner, who will now talk about the uh, correlations and some other figures. Thank you. All right, well, thank you to everybody that's joined us this evening. As you continue to join, uh, please mute yourself either on your audio or video so that we limit the feedback that comes and I'll get into the next section of our presentation. So this information relates very well to what Gary presented. Um, it's the correlations between the sell prices and each of the indices and EPDs. Um, so um, for any of you that are familiar with correlation values, I wouldn't necessarily call any of these strong correlations, but with such a large data set, uh, we're gonna look at kind of the, the relative correlation value and uh, kind of make our inferences from there. So I broke these into kind of groups of correlation values with sell price. The herd builder and grid master correlations, I would say are relatively high um, compared to some of the other values, which we would expect because these are economic indices and they combine multiple traits um, in order to basically identify bulls that are superior in uh, multiple areas uh, for either a maternal or a terminal scenario. Um, next, we see the correlations between some of the calving ease traits. Uh, if you're wondering why the birth weight correlation is negative, that would be because uh, we would prefer a, a more a lower birth weight value essentially. But um, we see from these three traits that calving ease direct was the one that I guess bull customers were depending more heavily on to make their selection decisions. Next, we look at some of the maternal traits. So those include milk, maintenance, energy, heifer pregnancy, and stability. Of these, stability had the highest correlation with sell price. When we go to the growth traits, um, we see that customers were relying pretty heavily on the yearling weight EPD, um, but certainly looking at weaning weight as well. Next, we go into our terminal traits, um, our carcass-oriented traits. 
So those are uh, carcass weight, yield grade, marbling, ribeye area, and back fat. And you see that, um, again, as we'd expect after seeing the yearling weight correlation, carcass weight was also important. Um, but there was uh, about the same emphasis put on marbling, ribeye area, and back fat. Um, what I find interesting is that you move over to those ultrasound figures, which um, those are for um, intermuscular fat, back fat, and ribeye area. Um, we see that um, customers were actually putting a little bit more emphasis on these ultrasound values than they were on the EPDs for those same traits. Um, so that tells us that uh, bull customers are relaying, relying pretty heavily on that um, ultrasound data, and we'll see that again in a later slide. Something that we looked at new this year compared to last year was the volume of high sellers. And if you recall that slide that Gary presented, um, we saw that there was a really big difference between the top quartile and the second quartile. And that's because of these, what we would label as high sellers. So just for the, the sake of this analysis, we call the high seller anything that sold for $15,000 or more. Um, this year, there were 78 bulls that uh, made that threshold or higher, and that was definitely up from last year where there was only 62 bulls sold at that um, price or higher. And also, those bulls averaged higher. They averaged $31,481 this year, and last year they were about $27,000. We also saw more sales that had a higher average. So this year, 21 sales that were attended by our staff Average five thousand dollars or more, and last year there was only eighteen of those cells. This is another analysis that we did on those high selling bulls, uh, the ones that were fifteen thousand dollars or more. Um, this is related to the traits that those bulls possessed, and so as you see, um, all of those um, bulls there was seventy eight of them, I believe that. Um, were $15,000 or more. They were in the top 25% for both herd builder and grid master, and even uh, better, they were in the top 4% for grid master. So clearly that was a really important index that people that were buying some of those high selling bulls were focusing on. Um, calving Ease Direct was also in the top 25% for those high selling bulls. Birth weight was um, in the top half, um, maybe not as strong, but that just tells us that people that were purchasing some of those kind of elite herd sires were focusing more on calving ease direct than birth weight. All of the growth traits were important, all in the top 10%. Um, dry matter intake, um, the reason that that one is probably so low is because this EPD actually wasn't um, put out there yet when the bull cell season was happening. Uh, this EPD was released towards the end of bull cell season, but I included it because I think it will be interesting to compare next year to see if people start selecting based on dry matter intake, but considering it wasn't even available for selection, it makes sense that it was um, not as high as the other traits. When you look at some of the maternal traits, um, you see that most of those fall in the top 50% for uh, selection but then you get down to some of the more carcass-oriented traits, and as we'd expect from looking at that grid master top 4%, uh, marbling, carcass weight, and ribeye area were all in the top uh, percentage for um, a selection criteria on those high selling bulls. However, when you get to fat and yield grade, you'll see that those um, weren't necessarily being selected for as, as lean bulls, and I think that makes sense because we observe when we go to cells that people generally lean towards the fleshier bulls, and, and there's two factors to that, both the feeding and the genetic component, and so um, obviously people were selecting for bulls that had a little bit more flesh on them. This is a map that I did which was similar to the town hall meeting last year, if you were able to join that. Um, so I'll go through this briefly, but I've actually got a comparison slide that'll come up next. So as you see in the West, um, there is a little over 500 head sold at um, 4,444 dollars. Um, when you get into Montana, uh, 13 about 1,300 head sold. Um, those average about 4690. Uh, get into the Rocky Mountain region, there was 636 head sold, averaging 5,433 dollars. Um, you'll notice that there is no figures in the Southwest region. 
That's not because there isn't cells down there. There was definitely some fall cells and there were some spring cells that our staff unfortunately was unable to get to, but that's why um, this region is blank. And uh, just to point out again, all of these figures are on cell, only on cells that our staff was attending. So it's certainly not all inclusive, but um, hopefully it contains a pretty good data set. Uh, when you get up to the Northern Plains region, there were uh, a little over 1,500 bulls sold up there. Um, averaging $4,340. This uh, region actually had the largest number of bulls sold. Uh, when you get into the Great Plains, you see there was uh, a little over 1,400 bulls sold, averaging 5,523, and that was the highest um, averaging region. Uh, you get into the Midwest and see 410 bulls sold um, at $3,615. And uh, then when you get into the Southwest, 63 heads sold at $4,672. Now we'll look at this map in a different way, and it's a comparison um, to last year. Um, and I think that uh, this is a very positive thing um, when you start analyzing it. So again, we'll go through the regions kind of like I just did. But um, in the West, there was actually 90 more head of bulls sold, and they were up on average by $120. So that's all very positive. It, it indicates to me that there's a very high demand for running bulls in that area when more bulls are being sold compared to last year and the average is also up. When you go to Montana, there were 110 head fewer sold. That's a pretty large region for Red Angus bulls. I don't think that's too significant on the head count, um, but the average was still up 85. Um, if you consider supply and demand, that makes sense. Less bulls sold, they're probably gonna bring a little bit more on average. Um, look at the Rocky Mountain region. This region had more bulls sold and the average was down. Again, I would say that's a little bit of supply and demand. Um, just offering more bulls is going to bring that average down a little bit. Northern Plains was up in headcount as well as in the average. Um, again, indicates to me there's, there's really high demand for Red Angus bulls in that area. And, and uh, that makes sense because we see a lot of commercial cattlemen that raise Red Angus in that region. And you get to the Great Plains, um, down on the head count a bit, but really high um, in the average compared to last year. So that's a positive development. In the Midwest, there are fewer bulls sold, but again, the average was up compared to last year. And then you look at the Southwest, um, not too many more head, but three. So that's still good. And then uh, it's also up on average by uh, a little over $300. So um, really interesting to me to look at some of that regional data. This is a breakdown of the top five states for bulls sold. We went over this a little bit before. Um, Montana had the highest head count. Um, South Dakota had the second most red angus bulls sold um, in cells that were attended by staff. Nebraska was third. Um, North Dakota ranks fourth and Kansas fifth in terms of the number of heads sold. And this is very similar to what we saw last year. I think the only change was that uh, South Dakota and Nebraska flipped. Now we'll get into some of the data that our staff spent a lot of time collecting. We really hope that this is beneficial to you as seed stock producers and just something to consider. And um, this is raw data. It's just based on what our, um, our observations were throughout the sell season. So um, just some suggestions and we'll just let the data speak for itself. So one of the factors that we looked at was the cell facility where um, the cells were held and uh, First, I'll walk you through how each one of these graphs are going to be set up. So obviously the number at the top is the average of those bulls in that category. And the number that is on the bar is the number of cells that fit into that category. So obviously there's a little bit of difference in how many cells um, fed into that data set. So that's why I included that was just for your information. But we see based on the cell facility, cells that were held on the ranch were the highest averaging. I know that not everybody is able and has um, kind of the ability to host a cell on your ranch, but if you are able to, that might be a consideration because um, those cells were the highest averaging. Um, cells that were held at a cell barn um, were the second highest averaging at about $3,900, and cells that were held at a feedlot or a hotel or a development center or even a show um, were the lowest averaging out of those three. Next, we'll look at the number of bulls offered in the cell. 
So we found that there was a, a pretty significant advantage if a seed stock producer was able to offer uh, 100 or more Red Angus bulls. The average on those cells was $5,360. Um, any cell that offered 50 to 100 bulls averaged 4,291. And if they offered less than 50, um, there was a bit of a price decrease. Um, those averaged 3,561. Um, fairly evenly distributed in terms of the number of cells that fit into each of those categories. Uh, by no means do I want to convey that you should try to um, cut less bulls or try um, to not be as tough when you're selecting the bulls for your cell. I think those cells that are successful, that are in the over 100 category, are able to offer a high volume bulls, but still very high quality. So I just want to point that out, but I did find that to be interesting, um, that the number of bulls offered in a cell did affect um, the average price. Something else that we looked at was whether or not the bulls ran through the ring or they a uh, video was just played during the cell. Um, not a huge difference in these averages, but we did find that um, showing the bulls on video had a slight advantage. Um, those averaged four thousand three hundred thirty-five dollars, whereas um, cells where the bulls were ran through the ring averaged four thousand one hundred sixty-two dollars. Next one I want to point out is online bidding availability. So essentially, if a seed stock producer offered um, the option for our customers to bid online, either by one option or two options of video companies. Um, those that offered that service um, averaged $4,310, and those that didn't um, had kind of a discount on their average by three, and that was $3,862. You'll see that there was a big difference in um, the number of cells that fit into those categories. Most people are offering online bidding. Um, this sell season, which is good to see because we, we see from this graph that there's an advantage in the, in the price there. So um, it's kind of the trend is changing in, in the bull selling business and having that ability to buy bulls online is important to customers. The next factor we looked at was hospitality and the way that I categorized this was whether or not the seed stock producer offered a pre and or post sell event. So a dinner or an educational meeting, uh, whether they offered um, the pre sell event or the post sell event or both, um, those all got put into that category. Those sales averaged $4,704. And those that didn't have a, like a pre or post sell event, a dinner or an educational, um, I said besides lunch because most sales do offer lunch, we appreciate that as staff, but those sales um, took about a $700 hit. So if you're not doing a, a pre or post sell event currently and um, are looking for innovative ways to uh, maybe improve your average, that might be a consideration. I think that bull sell customers really value um, getting to know their seed stock producer, which is um, can happen at a pre or post sell event. And also when you offer an educational event, it um, probably makes the bull customers feel like you're kind of investing into their education. Another factor we looked at was the catalog. Um, there wasn't a huge difference here, definitely not as big as we saw last year, but full color catalogs average $4,279. And those cells that have black and white catalogs average $4,232. So again, not a big difference, but um, a little bit an advantage of the full color catalogs. Another factor we looked at was whether or not an insurance representative was available on sale day um, to visit with uh, bull customers about options on insuring their, uh, their purchase. Um, if an insurance representative was present, those sales averaged $4,593. And if there was no insurance rep there, there was an average of $3,820. As you can see, most sales, I guess, more sales offered um, an insurance representative. So I think that's probably important to bull sell customers that they have that option to insure their bull. We also looked at sales that were a top dollar Angus seed stock partner. And if you're not familiar with this, um, basically, a seed stock partner has the ability to put the top dollar Angus logo next to the bulls that will help their customers qualify for that program. Um, those sales that were top dollar Angus seed stock partners averaged $4,450, and those that weren't averaged $4,224. So um, there was a slight advantage for those that were seed stock partners, but there were definitely fewer sales that offered that service. We also considered the age of bulls, and so year, cells that sold yearling bulls only 
averaged four thousand eight hundred and thirty nine dollars there were 50 cells that did that and then any cells that offered 18 month bowls or older so basically 18 month old age, age advantage bowls or two-year-olds um, took a slight price hit on their average at 4,574, which is interesting to consider because if you're running, a, if you're selling a yearling bull, you generally have less input costs in that bull. Um, so kind of a little bit of um, cost difference there, but I know there's definitely regions of the country where there's um, a demand for age advantage bulls. Next, we looked at ultrasound data and whether or not that data was provided. And I hinted at this a little bit earlier, but um, there was certainly a, a difference in the average if customers were provided with that ultrasound data. So um, nearly $5,000 on average for cells where ultrasound data was available. And on those where it was not provided, the average was $4,232. So there were more cells that did provide ultrasound data, but um, I think it's clear from this information that customers value having that information. So that's kind of it for some of my graphs and uh, some of the more technical stuff. This is a little bit more of a fun slide. Um, I'm a Snapchat user and we have a Snapchat for Red Angus. So if you're interested, uh, you can follow some of our travel adventures by following Red Angus America on Snapchat. At the beginning of the sell season, I had a naming contest for my travel buddy. I took um, this little fun cow with me to some of my cells, actually to all of my cells. She was my buddy, and so uh, here's some pictures of what the kinds of things that I would post on our Snapchat account. And uh, Brandy is the one that does the Instagram, but I'll just talk about this briefly. Um, she also posts um, any updates that Harold, Gary, or I send her on our Instagram account. So if you've got Instagram, then you can follow us at Red Angus America and uh, see our updates um, through that method. So with that, um, again, I'll remind everybody that if you have questions, please submit them to Chessie via email or to her via text. You can also use the chat box on your Ring Central to submit questions. And I will now turn it over to Harold and we'll address those questions at the end. Well, thanks, Katie. And for those of you that are uh, rang in on the phone, Chessie's text number is 903-563-1286 if you'd like to, to send, a, send a question via the text. Uh, so first and foremost, I'd just like to, again, reiterate what everyone said. Thanks for joining us this evening. Um, would also just like to say thanks uh, before I kind of get into my part of it for all the hospitality. Uh, you've seen the number of nights that we spend away and uh, a home cooked meal or for those of you that have opened your home, we truly appreciate that. Uh, it means a lot to us when we're out there. So I think my first slide uh, talks a little bit about the weather. Katie. So we did have some weather, as did all of you this year, and, and we see here that it made a bit of a difference in terms of price, uh, though there's not much you can do about that. Uh, certainly had a factor, um, and, and we had plenty of, of nice days, but we had a lot of terrible days this year too. Um, and, and Katie had to sort through all the descriptors that Gary and I used to describe the weather. Some of them included some pretty interesting adjectives because it was, it was bad at times. Uh, and we felt like winter just would not go away and uh, kind of welcome to 2018, the year January uh, lasted about four and a half months. So, uh, but that's not a big surprise as most of you guys, uh, we had some rough weather. We saw everything from, from freezing fog to, to ice storms, to blizzards, to uh, heavy snow to travel through, torrential downpours, um, flooding. Katie saw some flooding. I even saw a, a dust storm close an interstate going to a sale this year. So uh, we had a wide variety of weather that, that pretty much is indicative of, of what we've seen throughout the country from drought to, to heavy moisture. But uh, it was challenging, and I think more so this year because it seemed like every, every event we went to, uh, there would be a, a weather event involved at some point in it. But uh, again, congratulations to you folks, tough people, tough cattle. Uh, despite all those conditions, all we had to do was get there. You folks had to put bulls together. You had to put pins up. You had to do your regular chores. Uh, plus, think about feeding all of us and then uh, 
uh, probably several of you were calving cows during all that. So again, uh, we, and then were able to greet us with a smile on your face that, that only speaks to the resilience of Red Angus cattle people. So we do appreciate that. Some of the stuff I'm going to, to speak about tonight is maybe not as easily quantifiable and, and maybe we can't make graphs, but just some general consensus that Katie and Gary and I put together of things that we saw uh, throughout the year when we were, were visiting the bull sales. Um, last year I started with the first two bullet points and I, I did again this year simply because I, I do feel like uh, Red Angus continues to be the rancher's choice. Um, the convenience trades you folks have bred into these cattle certainly make them uh, a logical choice for most ranchers, and I think we're seeing a, more and more ranchers uh, making that logical choice. Uh, last year, I also included that EPDs and phenotype continue to trend upward, and I think they still do. Uh, we're seeing more EPD packages that meet the, con the, the, the cattleman's needs, and the phenotype, I think Gary and Katie and I all agreed, was better this year than any year we've seen. So uh, the cattle just continue to get better. We did notice one thing uh, as we visited with commercial ranchers and saw kind of what they were looking at. They did put uh, some emphasis this year, more so than usual, uh, on actual weights and ratios as well as phenotype. Uh, not that we can quantify that, but, but the bulls that we had marked as, as better phenotype tended this year uh, to be to bring more money, which was maybe a little bit different than, than, than what we'd seen in the past, but they were putting a little bit heavier emphasis on phenotype this year. Uh, we've seen all this uh, in earlier slides. The number of sales and sale attendance continues to go up. Uh, the, the good news is uh, we saw lots of new faces. Uh, there are a lot of ranchers that are, are sampling Red Angus. A lot of ranchers that have sampled them the last couple of years are now uh, piling in and, and using the bulls quite heavily and, and buying lots of bulls. So that's an exciting thing that we're seeing. That doesn't mean that, that we didn't see some problems as well. And, and so we, we did see some things that we need to keep, continue to work on. Last year, uh, I think I talked pretty extensively about feet and we still see, though not a high percentage, we still see enough that it's concerning. We see enough bulls out there uh, that have claw issues, the shape of the claw, claws already touching or maybe even crossed over, um, on the, especially on the front feet. Uh, definitely something to, uh, to keep in consideration when you're, when you're sorting your, your calves to keep as bulls. Two things that we added this year were back leg structure and front shoulder structure, and we thought this was something that, that maybe we hadn't noticed as much before, but was definitely an issue this year. Um, in back leg structure, we can probably be more specific and look specifically at the hock. We saw a lot of bulls that were either uh, a handful that were a little bit too straight out of their hock, but the majority maybe had plenty of set, but just didn't move their hock freely. Uh, didn't make their stride and, and was really sort of an issue. And then that front shoulder structure fit right into that, a little straighter out that shoulder, uh, which certainly affected their movement mobility. Uh, not again, a high percentage of bulls, but certainly something we feel like needs to be presented and that we need to keep our eyes on. Uh, the next one there uh, was one the very first year that was my biggest takeaway from Red Angus bull season was I didn't see any bulls uh, that had a testicle problem. This year, uh, I saw enough of them that I felt like it was worth mentioning. Uh, it's definitely something we need to keep on our radar. Uh, there are several things about that that we saw. Uh, the testicle shape, uh, we saw several bulls that maybe had uh, one larger than the other. Uh, you know, size could be an issue. We saw several bulls that were at the minimum maybe of, of what's acceptable for a breeding soundness exam. And then of course the, the suspension. I saw several uh, bulls that had slightly twisted testicles up to the point where they were 90 degrees. Um, so that's, that's a, an area of concern. I don't think it's a huge problem, but I think we need to be aware of it and continue to select for those bulls that, that, that carry those, uh, those perfectly shaped and, and good sized testicles. Last year, we, we discussed masculinity as a problem. I saw less of that as being a problem, but kept it on the screen because I do think uh, that, that several of, of our bulls that, in a, again, a very small percentage, were getting plenty feminine and not as many this year. So I think we're making strides in that, but I think it's definitely something that, that needs to continue to be on our radar. Back to the, the feet issue. Uh, most feet that we see are on target. And of course, this year it was more challenging than ever to see them because we did face some weather issues and some mud issues and, and, and all kinds of things. But we did see a lot of really good feet. 
but there too, we did see some that maybe were not so good. So we do need to be diligent. We do need to keep working on feet. We do need to, and as you can see, it's maybe not only even a, a claw or hoof issue, but the, the direction the front feet are heading. And I think that, that kind of goes into that front shoulder issue that we discussed. So again, uh, you hear us talk about it a lot, but I think we need to remain diligent. Commercial cattlemen are looking and uh, they, are, they are protecting themselves uh, on that. So it's definitely something we need to continue to work with. But we are very successful on, on several things. And, and one of those is, uh, I think, body condition score that's wanted by the commercial cattlemen is always a moving target. And as Katie mentioned, they do tend to like to buy the bulls that have uh, a little more condition on them. But this year, more than ever, I think we all agreed, we saw fewer bulls that were what we would consider over-conditioned. And we saw fewer bulls that were what we would consider under-conditioned. Uh, in other words, I thought you guys hit the mark dead on in terms of having those bulls in good rig. I know that's a tough to find that sweet spot, especially this year with the weather conditions you were up against. Uh, getting those bulls fed so they looked right is, a, is an art, and, and I felt like you guys really did a tremendous job with that. Um, rib shape and volume, red angus have long been known to add uh, fleshing ability and doability to a cow herd, and we continue to do that. These bulls are, are deep and have a lot of rib shape and plenty of volume. Uh, top shape and muscle, Katie, and Gary both mentioned that. Definitely something we see or hear when we visit feedlots and packers. They indicate that we need more ribeye in our red Angus cattle. And I think we're moving that direction. I think we've put more top in these cattle and we've seen that through the ribeye scans. Uh, more muscle are in these cattle and, and that's a good thing. I, I think we do need to be cautious whenever you add muscle there there comes a, a price with that but i think we'll, we'll all be very careful with that and we haven't haven't seen a lot of problems that come from it uh, but have definitely seen a noticeable difference in shape and muscle we've already hit on the balanced dpds we continue to see uh, a lot of producers or all producers are putting a, a real strong emphasis on that and creating balanced dpds for their customers and then of course satisfied repeat customers i talked earlier about seeing a lot of new faces uh, maybe more rewarding is talking to, to ranchers that are a bull sale and, and have been coming to that same bull sale for 20 or 30 years, uh, generations. Um, you know, you've got grandpa, dad, and, and the son or daughter all there uh, buying bulls from the same seed stock supplier, and that's impressive. So uh, congratulations to you folks on, on that. As far as the, the focus on customers, I wanted to go into just a little bit more detail on that. Um, We've done an analysis on all the bull sales that we attended and, and basically put a cost, uh, found the cost breaking points for certain EPD trades uh, and certain things that about the sales. I would encourage you to do the same thing in your own sale if you don't already do that. Uh, find the traits that the customers were willing to pay more. Uh, every time they spend a dollar at your ranch, they're telling you a story. Uh, it's our job to, to read that story and tell it figure out what they're telling us. And uh, so if you don't do that, I would encourage you to take a look. If there's certain EPD traits, if there's certain uh, phenotypic traits, or if there's uh, certain things that they're looking for, uh, I would encourage you to take a look at that. On the manager database, kind of what I'm talking about there is your sale catalog mailing list, probably more than anything. Um, I think that's a real important piece of information. Uh, about all the sales we went to, we used bidder numbers. Uh, so you're collecting a lot of information with names, addresses, and phone numbers. Uh, I encourage you to take a, a long look at that and, and really manage that. I know catalogs are extremely expensive to produce and expensive to mail, and that's not getting cheaper. Uh, but I think it's important to, to target the correct audience with those catalogs. Um, and, and you would be surprised the number of sales that I've gone to for four years and, and have I apply for a bidder number at every sale in my name. Um, and, and I still don't get sale catalogs at home. So uh, if, you, if you have a chance to go through that, I know you can't leave us in there forever uh, if we don't buy bulls, but uh, certainly take a look at those, those customers that showed up at your bull sale, uh, got, took, took the time to get a buyer's number, uh, probably ought to be on your list to get a, get a bull sale catalog the next year. I put on there visit other sales and I know time is of an essence when you're trying to put together your own sale and then once the sale happens you're trying to deliver bulls and you're calving cows and there's a lot going on but uh, 
it's always good to get a fresh look at what others are doing uh, and not just red angus breeders but but some other breeds might have some ideas or might do things a little differently that we could all learn a little bit from and then the final one that i have here and i'm going to go into a little more detail on the next slide about uh, is explore how red angus marketing programs can can help your customers we feel like, uh, and Gary mentioned that, that we like to speak a little bit before the sale and it's great to meet your customers, but there's uh, a lot of programs that we have that if, if your customers hear about it from you, their seed stock provider, and then they, they hear it followed up by one of us on the marketing team, it's a, it's a really good one-two punch uh, that really brings it home that these are important programs that will add value to their calf crop. Uh, we have a lot of options out there. We have a lot of programs that, that we feel uh, add value and we have data to back it up and, and we would, would love to visit with customers. Uh, if, if you have an opportunity to introduce us to customers at your sale uh, that you'd like to visit, that you think these programs would be beneficial for, that's, that's excellent because that really helps us uh, meet people and, and get out and target the folks you want us to. But also during the year, if you come up with some folks that you think these programs would be beneficial for, uh, Gary, Katie, Chessie, and I would love to visit with these folks. If you send us a name and, and a number, we'll sure give them a call and talk to them about some marketing programs that may help them. Uh, so, uh, again, we really appreciate the opportunity to work with, with you. And I think uh, Gary's going to wrap it up a little bit. And then hopefully you've been sending some questions in and, and we'll try to answer those. Thank you, Harold. Um, I think Katie put this slide in here for me. For some reason, I have got the reputation of not being a very good driver, and I think that's the reason that line is on the road like that. But um, I, um, I think the purpose of this slide is to uh, make sure that we, we're doing a good job of what we do, whether it's driving or putting on your bull sale or, or working with your customers. So. Um, I think everybody does a really, really good job. There's little areas we can improve in to make things better for everyone, but um, we're going to go ahead and see if there's any questions out there. And I think, think uh, you've had some opportunity to maybe text or get on chat or call Chessie. So with that, I will, uh, I will mute myself here and uh, find out what our questions are. Hi guys, uh, the first question is gonna go towards Katie's way, and that is, how many total bulls were sold in the USA, approximately? Uh, so that's a good question. Um, our data set um, was about 5,700 when I cleaned it up. I'll uh, remind everybody, we actually inputted most of this data by hand, so that, that involved Harold, Gary, and I uh, putting in reg numbers um, just based off of the catalog. So obviously there was some human error in that. By the time I cleaned up our data set, it was about 5,700 bulls. Before that, um, it was uh, just over 6,000. So that's how many red Angus bulls we saw sell. Um, obviously there was more than that sold in the U.S., um, but that's um, my best guess just based on our data that we collected. All righty. This next question will be towards Gary. Have there been any percentage market share studies done on Red Angus bulls in the marketplace? Not any specific studies. The, 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 the numbers that we do know are that uh, the, the total registration numbers, of course, by breed associations, we have to take that and extrapolate that uh, and look at the superior data again. If you look at the number, and this again is seven, eight years worth of data. If you look at the number of Red Angus sired calves in the marketplace from the superior sales, you've seen a steady uptick from about eight or nine percent to 13 percent of the calf, calves uh, that are in those sales. While uh, Angus, obviously the number one breed, has dropped. Uh, somewhat. Uh, Charlet and Simitol have picked a few up and Herefords remained about even. So as far as a total market share, um, we have increased numbers, uh, but to make an attempt at a guess, 
uh, that would be very difficult to do. I, I don't know how many Angus bulls are sold. You can find that, I think, on the Angus website. I have not looked at that. But we're chipping away a little bit at a time uh, into the other's numbers. So we do know that from the superior data. All righty. This next question is going to go back towards Katie's way. With customers looking more at actual weights, do you feel that those customers are not trusting the EPDs as much? Katie, you're actually on mute still. Thank you, Chessie. Sorry about that. Um, so the values that were presented on the correlation slide were actually ultrasound measures. Um, so we, I personally didn't do an analysis of the correlations between the sell prices and the actual weights. I did it based on the ultrasound value. So we did see that uh, bull customers were valuing the ultrasound values um, more than the EPDs related to those traits. Um, however, it's important to consider that ultrasound values also feed into the EPDs, and so um, those are important to collect. Um, good question, although I, I don't know how to directly address that one just because we didn't actually do a correlation between the actual values just with the ultrasound measures. Alrighty. And just so everyone knows, this presentation will be available later on. We'll have it up on our website. Uh, it, we're going to download the whole thing and then we'll put it on YouTube and put that link in our YouTube. It'll be in next week's e-news as well. Uh, I also just to let you know, last year's data was available because we did this town hall last year. Um, I'll have to ask Katie for a little bit more specifics on springs and falls, but we'll get that information out to those who asked that question. Uh, Katie, this is actually going to go back to you since you kind of put a little bit more of this data together. Was there any data on differences of breeders who offered guarantees on bulls sold? So uh, that is a great question. I, uh, I assume and my best guess would be that there is a price advantage for those breeders that offered a guarantee. We collected that data last year, but I found that there was such a variation in the kind of guarantee that was offered that it was difficult to analyze. Um, so we didn't put that into our factors this year. Um, so I know that's pretty, a pretty soft answer. We don't really have any hard data to support it. Um, obviously, I would assume there would be a, an advantage to um, breeders offering a, uh, a guarantee, but I, I don't have any hard numbers to back that. All righty. Uh, Harold, this next question is going to go to you. Was disposition a noticeable issue during sell season for you? Um, not really. Uh, I, and that was one thing I probably, I thought later I probably should have put in that slide set. I think it's something we need to continue to be diligent about. But right now, most breeders that, that come to Red Angus are coming to get, uh, that, are, that are new to the breed are coming to get the, the general disposition. Um, I didn't see a problem at all this year. Um, I didn't. I didn't get run out of the pen. That's good news. For sure. Um, here's another question we got in. Any correlation to bloodlines offered? What sire groups led the top twenty-five percent, etc.? Uh, Harold, do you want to answer that one for us? Sure, I can, uh, I can try. We didn't correlate anything with Sire. Um, just, just didn't do it. Um, obviously, there were a lot of, there, there were some Sires more, used more than others, but as far as if there was any one that stuck out as having a whole bunch of extra value, I, I wouldn't know which one it was. All righty. Uh, we'll give it here about a minute or two. I don't have any other questions. Again, y'all are more than welcome to email me. Uh, text me at 903-563-1286. Uh, or you're more than welcome to just get in the chat box here with us. Again, that phone number for those on their cells is 903-563-1286. And we'll give it here for a second and see if we get any more questions in. All 
All right, guys. I Any other questions coming in here for us? Katie, uh, one question that we've had posed to us, are we getting any questions about DMI and ADG from commercial producers yet? Um, clarification on that question, you mean like questions regarding information on those EPDs? Like commercial producers asking us I'm what gonna, I'm gonna go with yes on that. Okay, um, yeah, for sure, I mean, Obviously, there was two new EPDs um, that were released, and so there's an educational component to that, and so we do get questions. I guess um, that's hard to answer because those EPDs came out so late in sale season that um, we were mostly wrapped up by the time they came out. Um, we've had probably more questions so far from seed stock producers regarding those EPDs. They're, they're having, um, you know, a phase of, of learning exactly what those EPDs are. Um, also getting questions from commercial cattlemen. Um, but I think once those are out there um, for a while and, you know, people reading the different um, news releases that were released about those in the magazine and through e-news, um, just there's, a, there's an educational period. So we are getting questions. Um, both from seed stock producers and commercial cattlemen. All right. Any other final questions before we wrap it up here today for our uh, annual bull cell town hall meeting? All right, Gary, do you want to wrap us up here? Certainly, I'd just like to thank again everyone for joining. We had good uh, participation, nice crowd according to our participant number. And I guess if you have any other comments about how we can improve it or other ways, other things that you would like for us to take a look at or to talk about, uh, we would welcome those. So just email any one of us, give us a shout. Um, appreciate all the work that uh, my coworkers uh, have done this past sale season to get us through it and uh, appreciation to all of you seed stock producers who uh, again welcomed us to your ranch and uh, hosted us as staff so with that i will bid you good night and uh, again contact us if you have any other questions or thoughts If you're trying to log off on your computer, it'll be down in the bottom right hand side of the page and it'll say leave meeting. <laughs>